There's little doubt that artificial intelligence is having a big impact on millions of lives and many industries, and will continue to do so well into the future. And AI is being used widely by organizations to automate, capture new market share, and optimize customer experiences. Well, joining us to highlight the opportunities and the risks that artificial intelligence presents are Pat Bayari, who's Vice President Core AI and Chief Economist at Amazon, and Christina Savayani. She's the CEO at Features Analytics. So welcome both of you to Cybos. Thank Christina, you. if we can start with you. You're presenting at Cybos in the Discovery Zone. But first and foremost, if you could introduce yourself and perhaps describe what your company does. Good morning and thank you very much for this question. So uh, I have a strong uh, technology background. I uh, graduated with a master's degree in computer science from Polytechnic University of Bucharest in Romania. Afterwards, I got my PhD degree in applied sciences from Delft University of Technology, the Netherlands. Then I worked for Philips Applied Technologies. And uh, then, in fact, uh, I joined uh, a team, a startup in Belgium, where I was leading, in fact, the team to develop a new technology for cancer tissue characterization and ultrasound imaging. So that was a very fascinating uh, project because the challenge was, in fact, to analyze the big volumes of data to identify with high sensitivity and high specificity any malignant tissue present in the organ and to give to the patient an accurate diagnostics. And this is where I got the idea, in fact, to apply the same principles to detect fraud, which is a cancer of the financial industry. So this is how we started all this venture with the technology development in 2012. We incorporated the company in 2014, and uh, we are very excited to be here at uh, Cybos in the Discovery Zone. So we thank a lot for the Cybo to the Cybos organizer for, for uh, this opportunity, and we are present, in fact, with two types of products. One of them is a trading surveillance platform for detection of manipulations in the financial uh, markets, like foreign exchange, equities, derivatives, commodities. And the other one is a transaction scoring platform that we use to develop use cases like uh, fraud detection and prevention solutions, IML, KYC, and CDD. So it's, it's using uh, AI to detect fraud, treating fraud as a cancer effectively. But let's broaden this out, Pat, because look, everybody's talking about AI, but in your opinion, what can and can't be done with it? Christina's shown us one way. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of what's happening in industry, at least in my day job, is you're using the data to effectively program your computer. So rather than writing out algorithms explicitly, you're, uh, you're taking, um, taking data training a model, and then making a decision. So that could be anything from um, how a robot moves around a warehouse in Amazon to how we make core decisions, like how we uh, manage our inventory, transport our goods, uh, run search and recommendations. So um, uh, that's what can be done with it. There's lots of things that can't be done with it. Uh, let me tell you one. I, I think we're uh, a little bit on the cusp of, which is uh, to distinguish between cause and effect. So in, when you're making decisions in a business setting, you're frequently dealing with things that are pretty ambiguous. And you'd like to know, if I change my inventory level, change my search results, how does that change, say, the, uh, uh, contribute to the value of my corporation? Uh, so sussing those things out of the data is uh, uh, something we don't have quite down yet, and I think will be very, but it's a leg uh, people are working on. Mm. Uh, be important for uh, it to be used more broadly and more effectively well, in so business. One of, one of the holy grails, basically. Yeah. Uh, I've, uh, it's been a holy grail for a long time in fields like statistics or my field of econometrics uh, to, uh, to make good decisions. Mm. Christina, how do you see the overall situation in the financial industry and how AI can help? How do we harness or leverage the power of AI? Uh, I think the financial industry is going right now through a revolution, meaning there are so many new, for instance, payment systems, uh, services, products that are brought to the market, and all these are producing incredible uh, volumes of data. So one of the challenges of the industry is to, to deal with these high volumes of data. This uh, data is produced with high velocity, 
and it's also changing with high velocity. So this is the second V, let's say, uh, uh, the second challenge of the financial industry. And the third one, I would say, it's uh, the variety of the data because all these products, services are producing data coming from uh, many different data streams. So it's becoming actually a necessity to use technology, especially AI, to understand this data, to interpret this data, to be able to take uh, effective decisions. I would recommend to, to financial institutions uh, to look for AI solutions because there are many, many types of AI solutions that are able to produce intelligent insights in the data because these are the insights that they can use uh, to understand their business and to be competitive. I would also recommend solutions that are explainable, especially in the area where we operate, financial uh, crime compliance solutions. Um, uh, organizations like uh, compliance departments and regulators, but even uh, us uh, humans uh, need to understand the logic and the decision, uh, what is the logic and the reasons why uh, a certain decision is taken. I will also recommend uh, to, to look at AI solutions that are capable of uh, adapting themselves within the same uh, scoring production environment. So there is, uh, there is, uh, there are big advantages of using AI solutions. If I talk about the compliance uh, um, industry where we operate, uh, we have proven that we can reduce the cost, minimize the risk of exposure of financial institutions, but also producing these intelligent insights that can be used for the bi uh, by the business to, to develop new use cases. And Pat, as an expert in applied AI, I mean, Christina has outlined the challenges there. So how mm -hmm. can the industry actually take on those challenges? That is a challenge in itself. Yeah, let me tell you about one of the big challenges I see. Uh, when you get into problems that are more complicated, you need very different people to work together. Uh, for example, when we're making decisions like how we control our inventory, how we set our prices, how we run our search, you need your managers, your software developers, and then the people who work with data, you know, machine learning scientists, AI scientists, whatever you want to call them, to effectively collaborate. And the problem is, uh, people don't really know how to talk to each other. <laughs> Their languages are so different. And to, uh, to make that work effectively is, um, is difficult. And it requires uh, really good internal processes, um, some courage, from your upper management because it will be disruptive and um, actually a little bit of humility from folks to admit what they don't know on all sides. It's, uh, uh, it's hard to make these things work together effectively. Uh, it's very powerful when you can make it happen. Pat, there's clearly work to be done, but how would you assess the current progress of AI adoption? We're at very, very early stages. Here I'll put on my economist hat. Um, if you look at, uh, say, the productivity statistics for the developed world, they're terrible. Like, uh, we've had a decade <clears throat> of uh, very, very low productivity growth. So even though these technologies are diffusing, industries are investing heavily, if you look at how we measure the economy, it's not really having much of an effect. But that was true of um, the ICT revolution in the late 90s. Um, uh, it took four or five, six years of heavy investment before you started to see it uh, in a measurable way. And that's because these are hard technologies to deploy. Like there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of learning and a lot of disruption that happens within companies. And um, you know, technologies generally take time to work their way through the, uh, through the system. Mm. It'll be a couple of decades. Um, <clears throat> for this uh, for this technology to diffuse is, uh, uh, if not more, depending upon how broadly you want to define it. Which is interesting, Pat, because look, there's there's nothing new in essence about the AI conversation. It has been going on for quite some time. But what are the stumbling blocks that prevent the financial industry actually embracing it and moving at a, a faster pace? Is the industry really ready to embrace the AI? revolution. It is exciting. Christina's outlined the potential there, as have you. So why the slowness? Um, I think it's going to happen whether uh, individual firms are ready to embrace it or not. And uh, I'll just put on my economist hat one more time. What I see when I go to work every day 
is these technologies allow you to make much better decisions using data. Uh, human beings, by our nature, are not terribly good statisticians. Like, we just uh, making predictions and then making rational decisions, giving those predictions, our brains are not wired that way. But that's what these, uh, that's what these technologies do. Uh, so it's very powerful because you make better decisions. And um, uh, second, it allows you to continuously improve your processes because you're constantly tweaking and tuning and testing your models in ways that make your decisions better. When you're using rules of thumb and heuristics, those don't get better. But like models and science get better over time. So this is, a, um, uh, this is coming because you, you make much, much better decisions and um, uh, uh, and it cleans up uh, inefficiency and helps you grow faster. So it's coming whether we like it or not. And Christina, the same question to you, the, the stumbling blocks in the way uh, it's preventing the financial industry really getting up ahead of steam. I would say from our experience in working uh, with clients um, from the financial industry, a very important uh, stumbling um, um, a block is it's in fact uh, uh, the data quality, the data veracity is what we call. Why? Because we discovered working with clients that many times um, there are mistakes in saving the data, in transformations uh, that the data need to go through before it's being used uh, by the business. And all this, uh, how, how much you can trust the data, it's very important. What is the quality of the data? What is the data governance process? All these are slowing down actually the usage of the data because you can very well use the data but the data is wrong, and if the data is wrong, then the solutions that you are building are not, uh, uh, are not uh, meeting the, the, the targets of the business and are producing, uh, let's say, uh, um, different insights in the data that are not valuable, they are not genuine. So that's a, a big stumbling block. Uh, now, uh, another one, and I cannot agree more with Pat, it's uh, organizations should be more open to innovation internally. They should communicate better between the departments, but also being more open to outside innovation, because this is important. A lot of big organizations, obviously, they have uh, technology and data science teams uh, in place uh, to develop solutions for, for uh, certain use cases. But a lot of times um, there is uh, some skepti skepticism and maybe not always enough, uh, I would say, uh, skills inside the organization. And uh, uh, more, I, I would recommend for organizations to be a bit more humble and to, to look and to ask for help from outside. So from our experience, for instance, we have been working in a project very interesting where we could apply our AI technology and platform to optimize the settlement process. And uh, in fact, uh, it was driven by a young business team uh, and they asked internally in the organization and the answer was no, we cannot apply AI to do this, but we prove that we can. And that's interesting. I want to stay with you, Christine, on this point because you are an AI startup. And of course, one of the, the common themes that's often explored is the relationship between people in your situation collaborating with large financial institutions like banks and indeed others within the market infrastructure. So communication, one problem, but what other ways are there of improving this? Because it does seem like an inevitable marriage. You're going to have to start working together at some point. It's in your mutual interests. Absolutely. So uh, communication is key uh, for the organizations, but uh, I think there should be uh, more um, uh, more willing to develop this kind of strong collaborative platforms. Uh, for instance, if I talk about our area of financial crime compliance, there should be a stronger collaboration established between compliance departments, the back-end office, the front-end office, uh, the business, because many times these solutions are producing additional insights for the business, but also between regulators and outside vendors like big technology companies, but also to be open to, to boutique uh, companies like us, to, to technology vendors that are really bringing the innovation to, to the market. Pat, some people see AI as a potential danger to civilization itself. We've all seen the films, some better than others. Yeah. Um, but could you give us some concrete examples of collaboration that show success as related to human, machine, and Algos interaction? What's your point of view? Um, I think uh, certainly any technology can be misused, but I'm an optimist that in the long run, these will be forces for good. 
Uh, when you look at industries and you tear under the hood, what you frequently find is huge amounts of waste. For example, um, in the US, if you take a typical truck, 20% uh, of the miles it's driving are completely empty. Or if you go to, isn't that a shocking statistic? It's still an issue. Uh, if you go to, I read a study from Santa Clara University the other day that said produce in California, a third of it uh, is never harvested. It is literally dissed under. So there's these massive pockets of waste. And when I show up to work every day in my industry, what we're trying to do is take the data, uh, create markets, and make decisions so that you reduce that amount of waste. Uh, you know, suppose that you could take uh, these, em these empty trucks and make it 15% or 10% rather than 20%. Or uh, you could take this food that's wasted between the field and the customer and that no longer occurs. I view that as a profoundly good thing for society. It's less wasteful. It'll improve the productive capacities of the economy. And, um, uh, you know, we're at very early stages in this, but really uh, using the data and better decisions and lowering your costs and creating markets around things, I think are going to be essential to doing that. Presumably this could, uh, this could work with this fuel resources, I guess. I mean, on the planet, we only have a certain amount to use. Yeah. Yeah, take uh, in Seattle, there's a, uh, uh, a startup called Convoy. And I've learned a lot about transportation uh, working in Amazon. We ship just a few boxes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, Convoy, their business model is to try and create markets first using mobile and internet tech technology so that, suppose you have a truck going from the port of LA to Kansas City and the way it might operate now is like there's some local broker on the telephone who schedules it, yeah. but then it'll come back empty. If you can communicate, then you could create a market saying, hey, I've got an empty load. This is essentially wasted space. People would like to sell it. But then the, you put the AI on top of it to actually run the marketplace. This actually gets to be quite a complicated mathematical problem like how you route and match supply and demand in those settings. So that could be, um, uh, I think that of that is like a profoundly good thing on many on many dimensions. And these are just some simple examples. <laughs> to round things up, we wanted to ask a question to you both. What is, in simple terms, the winning formula? Starting with Christina. The winning formula for me, it's uh, really more, more openness to innovation and more collaboration uh, uh, to be made possible between uh, financial institutions and, uh, and uh, technology, outside technology vendors. And same question to you, Pat. What is the, the winning combination? Uh, <laughs> that's a hard question to answer in one minute. But um, uh, what I find is um, there's usually a um, kind of like a four-step process you do in automating things. The first is uh, you use the data to define what success is. So you don't use like a gazillion KPIs. You, uh, you put a stake in the ground and say, if I improve this number, this is success. Like an inventory for us, uh, costs versus benefits, and maybe uh, what does this do to the experience of our customers? Uh, second, you train models. Um, machine learned models, what have you. Third, use those models to make a decision. Fourth, you test it, because models are always wrong. And then you go back to the start. And a lot of this stuff, it's, uh, it's almost like going on a diet. It's, uh, you, you make a little bit of progress at a time, but you know, like if you make 50 basis points of progress, say in your cost structure in a year, that isn't transformative, but do it for a decade. That, that makes you a industry leader in terms of your cost structure, your customer experience, and it's really this kind of disciplined, iterative process that makes your decisions better. Because guesswork, 
never gets better. <laughs> Science gets better. <laughs> We're not going to argue with that. <laughs> Pat Bayari and Christina Saviani, thank you so much for joining us here on Cybos TV and have a wonderful Cybos week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank for you. Having thank us. you.